Hey guys, welcome to a new tutorial. My tutorials so far have been about technique, tactics, physical training, but I've missed out one very important area. You can be the fittest player, you can have the best technique or the best tactics. If you're not strong mentally, everything won't help you so much because you won't be able to bring your A game on court. Can they get out of a hole here? Top seeds. Match point. Oh, that's a fantastic. I, I think everybody of you heard about the flow. We talk about flow when your mind and your body are exactly on the same page. So everything just comes natural to you and that's exactly the state we want to have on court as long as possible. It won't work all the times, but I hope with those tips you will find more often into that flow state and win a lot more matches without being better technically or tactically or stronger, but just by being stronger mentally. First thing I want to talk about is what you do in between rallies. As I said, we have a very spe special situation in badminton. It's a little bit like in tennis. We have rallies and in between we have breaks where we uh, yeah, can think about, can focus about what is going on here. It can be an advantage, but also of course a disadvantage if we uh, feel too much pressure in between. But my first advice is have a clear structure what you do in between rallies. In my eyes, you should have three phases. You should react, you should relax, and you should focus. The first thing, the reaction, can be of course shouting, it can also be saying a swear word, swear word maybe, but don't be too loud and don't let the referee hear that if you have, a, have an umpire on court. But of course, uh, most of the times, hopefully a positive reaction, or also just like showing no reaction at all, but doing that consciously. Because with that reaction, you should, uh, you should finish the last rally off, like in your head, the rally came to an end, then you show the reaction and then you shouldn't, it shouldn't bother you anymore. So after that, you should have some time to relax, to breathe and to calm down. A match takes in between like 20 to maybe even 70, 80 minutes, depending on what, what level you're playing on. And it is just impossible to stay focused over such a long period of time. You will probably have experienced ups and downs during almost any match and also top players have these ups and downs because you cannot stay completely focused for such a long time. So that is important. Use those breaks in between rallies to also relax. You, it is okay if you just have no focus for four, five, six seconds in between. That will help you to be completely focused afterwards for the next rally. So a good thing here could be some breathing patterns if you really consciously breathe in a little bit longer and breathe out a little bit longer or having some pictures. I will come uh, to that point in the next part and in the next advice. And after that, after that re relaxation and phase, you have to focus again. Of course, you have to get clear again in your head, think about, okay, what I want to do, what I want to accomplish in the next rally, focus on the next rally only again. And then after that rally, again, the three phases come into play. Number two is a thing you will see many athletes do all around the world and this is develop routines. Routines can also um, help you in between rallies, like I said before, if you have a certain breathing pattern or what I um, did a couple of times or what I try to do in between rallies is just imagine um, you close your eyes and you have a candle or I have a candle in front of me and I just blow it out like that helped me to relax, get a different picture in my head and afterwards I was able to focus again on the next rally. So that could be a little routine you use in between rallies or for example before you surf if you have a lot of pressure. Um, but routines can also be something you do before a match to get focused. Just have a look at different badminton or uh, different tennis athletes. I think a very good example is Nozomi Okuhara. When you see her there are a lot of routines um, where she's just Bowing before she goes on court or off court, um, it takes quite some time to her for her to get to the to the box in between the sets and before and after every match. But I think that's a very powerful routine for her. So that helps her to be very focused on court. But keep in mind, you should always be able to do those routines before and during a match. And during a tournament, it always you have different circumstances. You don't always have the same possibilities. For example, you have a very special routine you want to do before every match, but then you don't have the chance to do it because I don't know, you don't have the 
things in that hall and you cannot prepare that way, then the routine can also be, be a disadvantage because then you have a, a negative thing in your head that says you, oh, I haven't done my routine this time and I won't be able to perform in a good way. So be careful, choose routines that you are always be able to do no matter where or what circumstances you find um, during a match. Advice number three, prepare what you can prepare. A really good example, I've seen it many times and I have to admit it also happened to me. I went on court and I knew I only had one racket with the perfect string and the perfect grip and if it, the strings, for example, if they break, I have to take another racket that I don't really like so much, but it is an important match for me. So I always had that in my mind. And I think you also know, maybe you have, have a similar situation where you know you're not perfectly prepared for that situation, even if the match or the, uh, the game you're going to play matters so much to you. So no matter if the strings break in the end or not, if you have to change to a worse racket or not, um, you always have that in mind subconsciously. So you're playing and always hoping, uh, I hope nothing will happen. And of course, that will distract you and you won't be able to perform on the same level like if you're really well prepared. Here also the routines come into play. So always be ready to make your routines, be ready. If you have the chance, go on court and test the courts, test the shuttles. And as I said, have your rackets ready, have your shoes ready and be sure that you will have the best equipment when you go on court and prepare and control everything that is under your control. In tip number one, I already said that taking breaks in between rallies is important, but breaks are also important when you're probably not playing really well or if your opponent is playing really well, then taking breaks is a very good tool to break his rhythm or to bring you back in the game. There are certain different ways how to do it. Of course, you can just take a little bit longer time, walk a little round. It's not illegal. When you play with an umpire, he has to call you back um, to play. So long you can also take a little round and just take your break. Try to break the rhythm of your opponent if you feel he's gaining the upper hand or you're just really not performing well. Advice number five is for everybody who is playing a lot of doubles and a lot of mixed doubles. And my tip here, work together, also on the mental area. So you can use um, having a partner beside you as an advantage. If you push yourself, if you know um, when does your partner place the best badminton and yeah, just do, do that and help him to get in a flow state. And that will also help you to get into a flow state as well. It can also be a disadvantage, of course, if you are working against each other. So if one play, player is playing on a really terrible and poor level and is not getting up, the chances are high that he will also draw you down and you will also get into yeah, a bad state of mind and getting out of your flow if you have been in a flow state. So try to work together and try to push yourself, know what your partner needs and in most cases no partner is happy if you say, oh, what are you doing after he's missing a shot? Encourage him to stay focused and show him that you are on the same page and you work together. Advice number six, visualization. And that is also something you can see all around the place. And top athletes are doing that a lot. They visualize all kinds of things and they also visualize, for example, their flow state. I can just recommend you, if you have a match where you felt that everything um, was perfect, everything went exactly the way you wanted it, write that feeling down and have maybe that small piece of paper in your bag or have it beside your bed at home and then read it every night or every time before you go to the training as many times as you can and try to visualize that flow state again and again and again and it will help you also when you're on court that you can also get back into that state. So visualization is a really powerful tool, but it needs a lot of practice. You can train your brain exactly like you can train your muscles, but also here it needs time. You need repetitions. And in this example, where you want to visualize your flow state, you have to do it over and over and over again. Another example, you could also um, imagine situations where you are under pressure, where it's 19 all in the third and you have to serve and you visualize that you're playing the perfect serve and win the rally. But if you do that over and over again, the next time you will be in that situation in real, then you are not that afraid. You have that good feeling and 
it can help you to play that perfect surf in that situation and win that rally also in real. Last but not least, you should know where your optimal performance zone is and also how you can get there. Every player is a little bit different and also when you see the best of the best play, they do not behave the same way on court, but still it seems like they are quite good at getting into a flow state and um, get into their optimal performance zone. There is a concept that there is a relation between arousal and performance. So if you have only very little arousal, also your performance won't be that high. But if you have a higher arousal, that's very important for sports, you can imagine, then also your performance goes up. But there is a certain point when too much arousal again brings you down. So if you are like too stiff, too cramped and you cannot perform anymore, um, then the curve goes down again. So you have to know where am I on this curve? Am I maybe a little bit on the right side? Am I, is there too much arousal for me or am I maybe a little bit too relaxed? So what, where do I have to be to have that highest peak here of my curve, to have that optimal performance zone? And there are different um, strategies to get to the left or the right of the curve. How to get to the right? That would be maybe pushing yourself, shouting. That is something when you, when you realize, oh, I'm a little bit down here, I'm too relaxed, then pushing can bring you up. If you are already here and you push yourself, that will also only make it worse. So you see here, more arousal won't give you a better performance. But if you um, are maybe see that you're here, then the opposite could be a good option. Stay relaxed, just breathe, take a little bit longer breaks, and that can bring you back up here into your optimal performance zone on the curve. Keep in mind that this curve always looks a little bit different from player to player. So some players have these optimal performance zone more on the right side. For example, Carolina Marin, I think I've never seen her being too aroused. I think she's always pushing herself, always shouting, and I don't have the impression that she can get too far to the right on the curve. On the other side of the spectrum for me is, for example, Hendra Setiawan from Indonesia. He's so relaxed, so calm, he's never, almost never shouting or showing any emotions. But if you look at his results, he has to be in the optimal performance zone so many times. So this, his curve is probably a lot more left than the one of Carolina Marin. Know what kind of player you are, know what kind of curve you have if you look at the optimal performance zone and then try to figure out during a match, should I be more maybe on the left side, more on the right side and what helps me to get into my optimal performance zone. So much for now, my seven tips for getting better in the mental game and I hope these tips will also help you to make the right decisions even when the going gets tough, when it's really close at the end of the games and eventually it will help you to win more matches if you are stronger in your head. If you like this video, um, please hit the like button, subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so and also um, activate the notifications so you hear about my latest videos and as usual, if there are any questions left, write them down in the comments. I would love to uh, get back to you and answer them there. So much for now. I hope I see you in the next video. See you there. Bye bye.